Hi, it's Dr. Centeno. Uh, thanks for joining me today uh, on our show, You've Got the Power. Going to be focusing today on an interesting topic and, and one really involving patient safety. Uh, on a quick second, I need to close a few things here. Got that. Okay. Uh, so the, the focus here is on injecting, uh, and today is on injecting the high pressure of a set joints. And over the weekend, I got sent a really disturbing video of a physician's assistant who was attempting to inject the C1, C2 facet joint. And in looking at the video, it was pretty concerning uh, what was happening. And so I thought it was a, a really good opportunity to discuss what it takes to inject those joints safely by showing you uh, what I would consider as an expert in this space to be an unsafe way to do it. And hopefully from that, you'll learn yourself okay, this is probably safe, this is probably unsafe, based on, on my uh, expert opinion. So we're gonna start with that uh, a little bit longer than usual because there's a lot to unpack here presentation. And then from there, we'll go into questions. You can ask questions about this topic or really any topic. I see questions already starting to come in. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. So we can go ahead and start that whole process. And I'll get the other one up. Okay, so uh, the title of this talk today is Injecting the C1C2 cassette joint under ultrasound, a PA with a very big needle. And again, the focus here is, uh, I'm not gonna talk about any specific provider or clinic. Uh, I got sent this video, I took some screenshots from it to educate patients on what I consider to be an unsafe way to inject this C1C2 facet joint. And hopefully through that, you'll, you'll learn something about these hypercervical uh, facet joint injections. So injecting the hypercervical uh, facet joints is something that requires extensive experience, specialized imaging, uh, guidance, and obviously high levels of advanced training. So a uh, pretty difficult thing to do. Now, these are the facet joints here. Let me get my pen out because that works well for me. So basically, you see the ones on the left, but this is the 0-1 facet joint. I'm going to circle some on the right. That's the one, two, that's the two, three, three, four, four, five, and on down. Uh, and these facet joints are about the size of your finger joints, and they can generate pain. Um, so the zero one generates pain into the head, the one, two goes up into the head, uh, the two, three. So if these joints are painful, they'll generally go to the head. Then by the time you get to the three, four, that kind of goes into the upper trap, the four, five, a little bit lower on the shoulder blade, and then lower uh, on the upper back and shoulder blade as we go down to five, six, and six, seven. So this is pretty important, certainly important in patients with craniosurgical instability, also important just with in patients who have neck pain in general. Now, the high upper cervical facet joints are the two at the very top. So this one is going to be the C0, C1 joint. C0 is the skull. And this one is going to be the C1, C2 facet joint. So those are uh, the joints we're talking about today. Now, a colleague, and this is really about since this video of a prolotherapy clinic, I'm not going to talk about the name of the clinic today, even if you ask me, because I don't think that's appropriate. But it was a, of a physician's assistant uh, injecting what she believed to be the C1, C2 joint under ultrasound. Now, as an expert in this area, I was able to look at that video, see what she was doing, see where the needle was, see where the prop was, see what that was showing on the screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm getting some feedback that you guys can't see 
the presentation. I'm not quite sure why that is. Let me stop this here for a second and I'll try to restart the sharing. Let's see here. I will try. Apparently, there's some issues with some people not being able to see the screen. I'm going to try to improve that the best I can and see if there's a way to help some of those issues. Okay, hopefully that fixes it. I'm going to start over again here and uh, see if that works. Let me get rid of one more thing. Okay, hopefully that will fix the issue, and I will start over with the screen here. So I'm going to restart the whole thing just to uh, make sure that everyone can see all of this. Okay, so, uh, and Carol can text me if there's still an issue, because uh, I can't see your, your comments or questions when I'm in the middle of doing this full screen. So, uh, what we're going to talk about today is injecting the Steel Institute for Sex Point of Ultrasound Guidance. Uh, and the title of this is a PA with a scary big needle. So injecting these hypercervical facet joints is something that requires extensive experience, specialized imaging, guidance, high levels of advanced training, et cetera. And the facet joints are finger-sized joints that live two at each level in your neck. And uh, the neck has uh, levels, so this is C0, and this is C1, and this is C2. So C0, C1 is right here, C1, C2 is right there, uh, and all the way down. Now, the upper neck joints prefer pain into the head, so that's 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. Then the mid-cervical joints kind of go into the upper trap area, and then the lower cervical joints kind of go into the upper back area. So whether you've got CCI and have the hypercervical facet joints involved or uh, any kind of neck pain issue, these facet joints may be causing different types of referred pain. Uh, again, the hypercervical facet joints are C0 through C2. Now, a colleague sent a video uh, from a prolotherapy clinic. I'm not going to get into the name of the clinic or the provider, but it was of a physician's assistant injecting what she believed to be the C1, C2 facet joint using ultrasound. Now, I can use that video to educate you on a dangerous and a safe way to perform this procedure. And hopefully, uh, even though I'm not going to show the whole video, I'll show stills of it since I can see where the probe is, where the needle is, and what's on the ultrasound screen as an expert in this area. I can hopefully teach you what to avoid. And also in the process, hopefully you learn something about how these procedures are done in, in the uh, and go through all of that. So this whole thing starts with really a very big needle. This is a, a 20 uh, cc syringe. And this is a pretty big needle. That's not a pretty big needle under certain circumstances, for instance, if we're using C-arm fluoroscopy. But for putting it straight in, which is what's going to happen here, uh, it's a very big deal for this application. And you can see the ultrasound probe is here, and I'm not going to show the ultrasound screen sometimes, but the good news is I can see the ultrasound screen the entire time to know what this provider was trying to do. So the first thing that you need to know is that uh, ultrasound probes are designed to either inject on short axis which is where the needle kind of comes on the side of the probe, and that's what I'm showing here, or on long axis, which is where the needle goes underneath the probe. Uh, and the difference is if you're injecting under short axis, you can only generally see the tip of the needle. And the good news is that manufacturers design these probes such that 
if you stay parallel to the side of the probe, the, the needle tip will generally be in a place where it can be imaged at a certain depth. So it helps with the accuracy if you're going to inject on what's called short axis, straight down. Now, it's always safer, however, to inject on what's called long axis, which is what this one is, because you can see the needle the entire time, and you can see exactly where it's starting, where it's going through, and where it's ending up. So, you know, even though it's, there are times it's more convenient and safe to use the short axis, uh, if you're in a very delicate area like this, you would really want to use a long axis approach because it's going to be far safer. Now, we see here that this provider took that very, very big needle, and the vast majority of the needle right now is buried in this woman's neck. Now, this woman seems like she's about average weight by looking at the amount of heft around her neck. So that's pretty darn deep right now. And I can see as an expert in this area, she's got the probe going this direction and she's got the needle going that direction. So they're not parallel. And what's happening is she's seeing the needle somewhere in here thinking that that's the tip, when in fact, the tip is way down here out of her imaging plane. Now this is a, a mistake I see fellows make all the time when I educate them on how to do short axis injections. They lose control of that needle tip. It's a rookie move. Now, you don't want to make a rookie mistake, however, in this part of the neck, because that's a concern, uh, obviously. Because if you lose track where that needle tip is and then you inject, you can cause a posterior circulation stroke here or a high spinal cord injury. So uh, definitely something you wouldn't want to do. And again, the reason why I have a picture here of Russian roulette is that if that needle is in the wrong spot, it could be in the vertebral artery. And if you inject a prolotherapy solution there, you're going to stroke out the patient or you're at high risk for stroking out the patient. And if you were to, if it were instead in the spinal canal and you inject, you can get a high spinal and that means the patient stops breathing or you can uh, obviously inject into the spinal cord. I hope that the patient's awake and you would know if you're in the spinal cord, but you really wouldn't know if you're uh, in the spinal canal about to inject intradural until it's too late and the patient stops breathing and you've got to resuscitate them for the next two hours until they can breathe again. If you can't do that, the patient's dead. So here's what she's trying to do and why it's also very concerning. Now, if the probe were this way, straight down, that, and, and she was coming in under the probe like this, some of this risk would be mitigated. There's all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't want to use ultrasound to do that injection, but at least some of the risk would be mitigated. But instead, the probe is coming at an angle here. So over here, I've drawn what uh, she's seeing on the screen, and that's represented by this box, which shows that, this rectangle. And this is the target, uh, the C1, C2 facet joint. The problem is by coming in this way, you're threading the needle here, if you will, because if your needle strays off to the left, you end up going in between the C1, C2 uh, vertebra into the spinal canal and potentially causing a spinal cord injury. If your needle strays slightly off to the right, you will be in the vertebral artery, which supplies blood to the back of the brain. Um, so just by choosing this injection plane, she's created a very, very uh, high risk procedure, in my opinion, meaning that she's maximized the risk of the injection rather than minimize it. And I suspect that that's because of a lack of experience in this area, a lack of experience with ultrasound, probably someone better to do it this way, and didn't really understand how these procedures are usually done. Those are all my, my personal best guesses. Now, you can dramatically improve patient safety 
if you do this a completely different way. So the first thing you'd want to do is you would only want to use uh, CRM fluoroscopy. I'll show you why. And you really wouldn't want to use uh, an ultrasound machine to do this injection. Now listen, we've got both in every room of our uh, practice, every procedure room. Uh, I've lost count of how many ultrasound machines that we use. Uh, they are uh, very, very helpful in the right circumstances, but not this circumstance. And let me show you why. So the first thing is, if we use x-ray and we go to a straight down type injection approach, we do a couple things. First is, we increase the size of the target here because we're coming straight down. And this is what that looks like on x-ray. You can see it right there. It's a large target. And you want a large target. You want to maximize the size of that target. And we minimize the other problems then because the no-go zone that could dust up in the spinal canal is now way over here. And it's very easy to see where the needle is, which we can see right here. So we do know not to go there. The problem under ultrasound is if you lose track of that needle tip, it may stray into the spinal canal, or in this case, may stray into this other no-go zone which is over here in the vertebral artery, and you wouldn't really know it, but you would know it under x-ray. So that's the big difference between these technologies and why you would not want to use ultrasound here, uh, because you're just increasing patient risk by using that type of technology versus a CRM fluoroscope. And uh, obviously, let's say you've got someone who doesn't own a CRM, and they say, I can do this procedure safely, under ultrasound. I'm still dubious about that claim, but you probably want to do it again in that sagittal direction. And you'd want to use this approach going underneath the probe and not what she's attempting to do in this video where she's going on the side of the probe. So you want, and because that's going to mitigate your risk, you're going to be able to see that needle the entire time. Whereas here, it's very easy to lose track of the needle tip uh, if you're going on the side of the probe, which she's trying to do here. And you, this is the reason why you'd want to use x-ray. There's an interventional cardiology package called DSA, or Digital Subtraction Angiography. And DSA allows you to get rid of all that background noise, all those shadows you normally see and it allows you to see if your contrast is going into the vertebral artery uh, very easily. Now, the good news is if it is going to the vertebral artery, you're injecting something that's safe, that's used, injected into arteries all the time. So that's no harm, no foul. But if you inject something else in there, for instance, like prolotherapy solution, you could stroke out the patient. So that's the reason to use the fluoroscope with a special interventional cardiology package, which most of them don't have, ours do, digital subtraction and geography to make sure you're not in that artery. And then you want to do an arthrogram, right? You can see contrast going in the joint. And again, you're doing this before you're injecting anything into the joint. So you get a check mark to say, yep, this stuff is going into the joint. She can't see that on that ultrasound. In fact, you can barely see where the joint is, and you're certainly not going to see it going into the joint. So you're not going to be 100% sure that you're in the joint on ultrasound, but you will be 100% sure uh, if you're using uh, CR microscopy with uh, radiographic contrast. And then uh, you want to, again, like I said before, inject something innocuous before injecting something that might cause problems if it's in the wrong spot. Obviously, injecting something uh, helpful in the right spot is great, but something helpful in a joint may be disastrous in an artery. So that's the reason for injecting contrast before you put any active ingredient in this patient's body. And, and then finally, the obvious one, right, is what in the world are we doing having a physician's assistant, a PA with less than half the training 
of a physician specialist do this procedure. Uh, most physician specialists won't do these procedures because they don't feel like they have enough experience with this particular injection. And the idea of using a PA to do this, to me, in my personal opinion, is totally nuts. I have no idea why an MD practice would use a PA or a physician's assistant to do this procedure. That doesn't make any sense to me. So in conclusion, you can uh, inject these joints very safely. I've done it thousands of times. I believe I've got the world's largest experience in injecting these joints. So that's not a problem, but you have to take certain precautions. And there's lots of ways to keep the patient safe. So hopefully, after watching all this, you understand something about how to keep patients safe. And obviously, if all those check marks aren't there, then that's a reason for concern. So I'm going to go and take uh, questions now, and uh, we'll see what's come in here, and I'll start answering those. And again, you can ask questions about this or any other topic that you have, not just this. Okay. Andreas, uh, hi, doctor. I have C23, three millimeters of laxity, posterior and anterior ligaments at flexion and extension. So I'm assuming uh, they would inject posterior and anterior ligaments right. Uh, um, Andreas, I'm not quite sure exactly what you mean there. I think what you're saying is that C23 in particular moves forward or C2 moves forward on C3 in flexion, and then in extension, it moves backwards for a total translation of three millimeters. If that's the case, then yes, you may need both anterior and posterior uh, uh, ligaments injected, but just realize that's a highly specialized thing to do the anterior side. So as to whether or not any particular clinic can do that, I, I, I need to know which clinic you're talking about there to be sure. Um, let's see here. I think I fixed the screen issue. Okay, seem to have work there. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Hoping I fixed all of that. Uh, does injecting the facet points help a bulging disc, i.e. 5-6? It's probably not going to help a bulging disc be unbulged, but it may because if you inject the facet joints, they'll leak out dural and around the nerve. It may help the nerve itself. Uh, it may help the nerve itself do much better, regardless of whether or not there is a, uh, a bulging disc. Let's see here. Okay, uh, Liam, I have seen the ligaments of the CCJ become calcified like the style of hyoid sometimes does. Um, yeah, it, it's, I've seen a few that have become calcified, although not that many. Uh, so I would say probably less than 1% to 5% of our patients have any calcification of those ligaments. Now, sometimes what we'll see is little osteophytes or bone spurs that get pulled off that's more common, maybe 10 or 20% of the CCI patients we see. But as far as becoming completely calcified, uh, that, seems, uh, uh, that seems more common, or I'm sorry, less common. Uh, Robert, I see because you can get a clear X, Y, Z, and then you can hear. Yeah, so the biggest problem with ultrasound is that um, unless you're an extremely experienced provider with it and you're using that long axis approach, your needle can veer. Now, there are times where if, if it veers five millimeters one way or the other way, no harm, no foul, based on the part of the body that you're in. But in this part of the body, you, that's not tolerable, it's not safe. Uh, key takeaway is ultrasound not smart for C1C2. Yeah, I think that is the key takeaway. Um, it's really not the it's really not the best way to protect the patient. 
the best way to protect the patient here would be fluoroscopy with digital subtraction angiography. But again, there are other times where ultrasound might be the right thing to use. It just depends on what it is we're trying to inject. Uh, which substance are you probably injecting? Well, that particular physician's assistant seemed to be injecting prolotherapy solution. Um, we wouldn't inject prolotherapy solution in the upper cervical joints. We would tend to do either PRP or bone marrow concentrate. Uh, Robert, uh, I was curious myself why a PA would dare touch C1, C2, and above. Yeah, I would agree. It doesn't make sense to me, given that you have physician subspecialists who have done entire interventional spine fellowships and have decades of experience injecting tens of thousands of spinal structures who won't tuck that area with a 10-foot pole, why you would have a physician's assistant in the medical clinic do that kind of procedure. I, I, would, I would agree with you. It doesn't, doesn't calculate to me either. Uh, Phil, am I right in thinking PRP and stem cells tried to kill ligaments back to the original less correct state, where it's probably used dextrose as the irritant and create scar tissue? Not really. Um, I think the pro studies tend to show that you, you get uh, a stronger ligament. So I think they'll all work towards that direction. I think the difference is uh, that. Uh, the number of treatments required to get there is what we see. So, for example, um, when you first get any kind of ligament healing, it's always what we would call scar tissue, which is where the, the fibers get laid down haphazardly. But then as you load that area, those fibers line, and you tend to get more of a functional tendon or ligament. Uh, so I don't see a huge difference in the in the end result, uh, the two big differences would be the number of treatments required and the amount of damage that each technology can handle, Perlo being the least damaged, Bummer concentrate being the most damaged. Uh, Robert, to excess of collateral vessel growth, varicose causing touch with injecting zero C1. Haven't seen that. Really, if we're talking about collaterals, they're pretty small usually. So haven't seen any particular issues with collateral in that area or collaterals in that area. I'd actually tend to have a came in question. Can you talk about how you mix PRP with culture stem cells for patients who don't have enough cells to reject the areas that came in with the cell PRP mixture still be sufficient to address healing of lumen, which are cuff, shoulder arthritic change as opposed to using the cultured cells. Um, Yes, yeah, so we, we add PRP to culture expanded stem cells in Cayman in a very similar way uh, that we would add PRP to bone marrow concentrate here in the United States. Uh, as far as not having enough cells in Cayman, that can happen, but that's pretty unusual. Usually it's the opposite. Usually we have too many cells in Cayman. Um, so if you were in that rare situation where you didn't have enough cells in Cayman, and remember Cayman is where we're culture expanding, or their culture expanding, growing the cells to bigger numbers, then uh, you could add additional PRP, or you could also take a bone marrow aspirate during the injection or right before the injection that morning to further extend out uh, the cells, et cetera. Uh, why did, if true, the FDA ban the use of adipose stem cells? Uh, the FDA ban the use of stromovascular fractions. So that's when you take fat, you digest the structural component or collagen out of the fat using usually collagenase or collagenase, and then you concentrate the cells. That's called stromovascular fraction, and FDA banned it. Why did they ban it? They drew a line in the sand, and that just happened to be over the line. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Scott, well, perceptual damage always shown in MRI such as uh, such that lack of MRI evidence can rule out uh, Z joint pain. No, it won't always show. Let me see if I can pull up uh, a blog I did on that not too long ago, just because it's really on point there. Uh,
Okay, let's see if I can find that first. Here it is. So let me go share that. Scott. Yeah, I think, I think bandwidth today is not great. Apologize for that. Um, okay, so here's a good example of what it is we're talking about. So this is, uh, actually, let me give you an even better one. Here we go. So this is a, uh, these are histology slides of uh, significant facet joint injury. One's got a small fracture. Uh, the other two show bleeding within the facet joint. And you can see on the histology slides, they look beautiful, right? You can see all this detail. This is the cartilage. This is the bone. You can see blood in there. You can see a little fracture here. Uh, however, uh, when we switch to the best MRI we have and we blow that up, that's what a facet joint looks like on pre Tesla MRI. So it looks nothing like what you just saw. You can't see all of that detail. If anything, you see kind of a blurry blob. Now you can tell that the blurry blob is uh, hypertrophied or enlarged, in which case if it's enlarged, uh, then you've got facet arthritis. But you couldn't tell if the facet joint is injured for the most part on MRI. Uh, that doesn't work. You'd have to do a diagnostic block within that facet joint uh, to get there. Ed, uh, can a retroodontal panis cause pain? Um, more so from the standpoint that it's an area of swelling, so anything swollen can cause pain. And uh, in addition to that, it may put pressure on the brainstem and spinal cord in addition to the dens. But it's mostly an indication of long-term instability and how that particular body is handling instability, i.e. not well. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, it's the, the treatment for it is pretty much always the same, and that is to try to improve the stability to see that area stop swelling. Uh, HRH, uh, clinic pursuing FDA approval to use stem cell CCI in other areas. Um, I think you might be misunderstanding the regulations. So when it comes to bone or concentrate, that's a same day autologous product. So that's actually not regulated by FDA. That's just a medical procedure, no different than a knee arthroscopy procedure. Uh, that being different from if we were to culture cells and make the claim that those cultured cells could be used to treat uh, CCI in this case, that would be creating a drug product that would have to go through FDA approval. Uh, so, got no plans to use cultured stem cells because it's really not necessary to treat CCI. As far as using PRP or Clomera concentrate, those are things that, that need to go through FDA approval. They're considered practice of medicine. So, there's some misunderstanding on your part there in, in what all that means. Scott, those questions that really don't appear here in the chat, this must be a rebroadcast. Questions on the video don't appear here in the chat. I think they're not appearing on your chat because this is running off of three different sites. So it's running off of two Facebook uh, pages, Synthetic Schultz and Regenix, and one YouTube feed. So uh, you're, you're only seeing whichever one of those you're on, whereas I'm seeing all of them from all three. So not, not a rebroadcast at this point. Uh, do you foresee the PSA procedure eventually be covered by insurance? Unlikely. We've got coverage uh, for uh, the PSL has coverage through about 600 employers currently. Uh, but as far as larger insurance plans, that's probably going to take a while. So I've got no time frame for that. So if you're if you're waiting for insurance coverage, I, I don't think that's a smart move at this point for that procedure. Now, we probably will see insurance coverage for things like platelet-rich plasma and knee arthritis, or we may see insurance coverage for things like platelet-rich plasma to use in epicondylitis, but very unlikely that we would see it uh, uh, for the PXL procedure anytime soon. Uh, Robert, regarding tears in muscles or tendons, do you suggest the use of a scaffold along with PRP? Um, not really needed for the most part, because as soon as something like bone marrow or PRP 
come in contact with free collagen, which would be present in muscle or tendon tears, uh, that causes it to coagulate, and you've got their nature's, nature's best scaffold ever devised, which is a blood clot. So generally not required for what it is we're trying to do. Yeah, that's why. Um, uh, Mircea, can injection of tumor even only with contrast uh, can create bleeding, causing prevention of reverse neurologic issues during death of patient? Not usually, meaning uh, retrieval arteries can be related uh, to be injected for uh, vascular studies. Uh, and uh, so it's something you definitely wouldn't want to do on purpose, but the risk is, is fairly low uh, in doing that. Now, what you inject matters. If you were to inject a prolotherapy solution, that's a bad day for everybody. That's one of the reasons why we've never used prolotherapy for this for this specific purpose. Uh, but as far as uh, contrast designed to go into arteries, not, not a big deal. Because what you're going to see is, well, there may be some localized bleeding in there that's going to stop very, very quickly. Uh, and this same way, you know, listen, we've all had blood drawn and my blood drawn over the weekend. Um, you know, that you put some pressure on it and that goes away. Uh, yeah, Robert, uh, that's right. I think seven, seven test level oh, will help more because you can see more as to whether or not you can see a lot. That's going to be a good question. The vertebral artery is hit is a fairly quick to heal a puncture. Um, yes, yeah, never seen an issue with that a few times it gets it gets hit. So um, not, not a big issue, but again, you wouldn't want to go cannulating it all day, every day. And the likelihood of hitting vertebral artery in a well-done floral procedure is probably only 1%. So um, it's you know, a very, very small number of patients. Phil, you know much about the theory that certain viruses may cause ligament laxity and interfere with collagen synthesis that arises now how it manifests? Yeah, so Phil, I don't think we know enough about that yet. Uh, so uh, is it possible? Sure, it's possible, but do I, do I, can I say that the research currently supports that? I would say no, the research currently uh, doesn't support that, but it may at some point. Doug, how is a plica pain in the medial knee different from arthritis pain? Can PRP uh, be used to treat pain from a plica? Um, in general, PRP can be used to treat pain from a plica, but you know, Doug, you have to realize that plica is something I, I don't necessarily believe in, uh, meaning it's what I call the Bigfoot of knee pain. Um, and to me, it's an excuse uh, for an orthopedic surgeon uh, when they really don't know what's causing pain. So you may want to read uh, this blog on the Regenix.com site. Just type in Plica under search, which is over here. You can just type in Plica there. And this one will come up uh, because I think it's important to read that. Uh, if there is a little area of the synovium which is inflamed, the question then becomes, why is it inflamed and how do we fix that? It's, so it's not something to be cut out. Cutting out synovium is generally a bad idea, but surgeons do it all the time. So uh, not something I would believe as a, as a diagnosis um, for what's causing pain in a knee. Okay, other questions that anyone has here today? Here we go. Uh, HRH, uh, will ligament damage show up uh, on a DMX immediately after neck trauma? Does it take 12 weeks or more? No, ligament damage should show up if you can get it immediately. Now, you may go through an inflammatory period of, let's say, a week or two where it would be less likely to show up because of the acute swelling causing some stability. But either immediately or, you know, after about two weeks, it should show up just fine.
rather are there cases in regen injections where inflammation is too high? And that needs to be managed. Uh, the answer is, is yes, we've seen that. So if you're uh, significantly overweight um, and or have a metabolic syndrome, metabolic syndrome would mean high systemic inflammation, high triglycerides, poor blood sugar control, increased weight, increased blood pressure, then you're more likely to have a, an excessive inflammatory response. Uh, and in regen injections, we generally go ahead and manage that um, if that's present. So what I mean by managing that, let's say in the knee, you know, we would see severe swelling in that case. We can put in some extremely low-dose anti-inflammatory that won't hurt the cells that will downregulate inflammation after the procedure as an example. Uh, don't know why that one's not proceeding there. I've got another question here. Uh, Phil, are injected cervical facetrons and ligaments healed by PRP stem cell as good as new or are they always a little weaker? Um, Phil, like that's what we're treating. Um, I would never say that anything is good as new. Um, I can say that ligaments can be tightened. Uh, we've done that research in the neck and published that over 15 years ago. And we can objectively show that we can tighten ligaments and reduce instability in the neck. Uh, as far as making joints like new, I, I would never ever make that claim for anything, whether it's this culture expanded stem cells, et cetera. And if you already have a lot of joint damage, PRP is going to mitigate symptoms from that damage, but it's not going to make you have a new uh, joint. Uh, does CCI cause dysautonomia only from brainstem compression? I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen here. Does CCI cause dysautonomia only from brainstem compression? Are there other ways we can cause those types of symptoms? Yeah, Peter, it can certainly cause issues, we believe, with the vagus nerve. So if you go to the same website, we pull that blog up for, for you so you can uh, read that at your leisure. So that's the progenics.com site. And I believe it's this one here. Yeah, so this one just talks about the location of the vagus nerve in relationship to C1 and C2. So you see this from the front here. Vagus nerve lives right in front of that C1. So you've got instability at C1, C2 that can irritate the vagus nerve and lead to a lot of dysautonomia type symptoms. So uh, brainstem compression would not need to be present for that to happen. Uh, Megan, can you inject tendons on Atlas? Yes, that can be done, not a problem. Tom, can sympathetic overactivity, feeling like you're in a low level fight or flight all the time be explained by CCI? Uh, it can, and that's the same uh, vagus nerve that we're talking about here. Realize that the vagus nerve is also the chill out nerve, so it gets, act it gets activated or stimulated. Um, you go into parasympathetic mode, which is chill out mode. Uh, if uh, it's irritated, it doesn't get uh, stimulated like that. It doesn't work as well. And hence, you can't get into that chill out mode. So uh, that would be the mechanism for how CCI can impact those sorts of things. Okay, other questions I can answer. To the extent that that video didn't uh, show up as well as it could, I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and voice that over and turn it into a separate video uh, and then post the separate video on Facebook and YouTube just to make sure that there's a good copy of that out there because I think that's all important information to, to know. Um, H, how likely is it for CCI symptoms to improve just with PICL, PICL and AO adjustment? Um, essentially, is adjustment necessary? 
IHRH, if you've got a chiropractor, a cervical chiropractor, NUCA or AO, who you think uh, can help you and seems to be helping your symptoms, we definitely encourage you to do that afterwards. Uh, and we would expect better results with it than without. Okay, any other questions that are out there today? Okay, guys, so what we're talking about today is just um, unsafe, in my opinion, and safe ways to inject the C1-C2 joint. Uh, I showed you an unsafe way that I saw it being done over the weekend. And, you know, listen, I'm sure there's more of those out there. I just happened to look at one particular video. Uh, I haven't talked about which clinic that is on purpose. And, and, and also because there's probably many clinics doing it in a very similar way. Uh, we also went over the safe way it can be done. And uh, hopefully that was uh, enough to have you learn something about the difference between the two. So thanks so much for watching. I will be here this Friday. Um, and we'll have a new topic on Friday. Hopefully some better bandwidth. And like I said, I'll go ahead and, and record that video and put it up separately just so that that video is out there separately without any chalk or other issues that you might have experienced. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.